Uh, welcome. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Um, so this is uh, the next installment in our um, uh, visiting professor series here for our Foot and Ankle Conference. So um, um, it's my pleasure to invite and welcome Rob Sandrock. Um, he's been a friend of mine for a long time. Um, he did all of his training at University of West Virginia, WVU, yeah. what they say. <clears throat> um, and then trained, uh, trained with our colleagues up in Columbus for his fellowship. Uh, and then he was on faculty at West Virginia. He's now in private practice in Florida. So he has been a part of this uh, lapoplasty journey, uh, essentially from the beginning. Um, so this, uh, this technology really changed the way we think about the lapidus procedure. And I think the, um, you know, the, the, the technique and implants are, are unique and I think really good. And <clears throat> most of us are familiar with it, but we have a chance now to hear a little bit of the backstory and then get in the lab and, and play around with this as well as some of the other um, implants and techniques that this company has developed. So um, thank you uh, to uh, Trees for, um, and Bird Medical for supporting this conference and, and uh, bringing Rob out to give this lecture and, and do the lab. Uh, and so with that, we'll hand it over to Rob. And then as, as long as you want to go is good, um, uh, one of the fellows has prepared cases in case there's time at the end, but we'll okay. maybe lecture, we'll do some Q and A and figure it out. All right. All right. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so I said, my name is Bob Santrock. I, I live in Amelia Island, Florida now. So that is on the uh, northern uh, Atlantic coast of Florida. I moved there uh, a year ago. I started my practice two months ago. And uh, it's now, uh, I'm in the last phase of my career. So I'm trying to slow things down a little bit. I get to do what I love to do. I've geared most of my practice around just doing bunions now but I'm still serving as an adjunct professor at Duke University. Uh, so I still get a chance to interact with fellows, residents and medical students. And so it's a lot of fun. I've been in academics most of my life. Um, the backstory with uh, lapoplasty and trees, and pardon me for, I didn't dress up. I know I see Dr. Hunt dressed in a nice jacket here today, but I, was, I had to make a trip before I got here and my son and I were sharing a garment bag and I forgot. He has all the rest of my clothes. <laughs> so, so we split ways when I came to Denver and he took my dress clothes. So I apologize. Um, as you can see, these, these slides are labeled uh, with uh, Treese Medical Concepts. And that's because I've been with the company since the very beginning. I'm an independent uh, surgeon. I'm a scientist. Um, but this has been a great collaboration with uh, John Treese and his company. And so I'm a paid consultant, just so you're well, well aware of the disclosure there. I've been with them since the very beginning. And what is lapoplasty is it's today, if you say the word lapoplasty to me, um, I'm referring to this entire family of surgeries that we do. Essentially, we're doing three-dimensional anatomic correction for midfoot, forefoot deformities, and essentially doing a recovery that is uh, as quickly as possible to be on your feet. And so that required a little bit different thinking in the hardware, and we're going to go through that. And the talk today won't really be centered on lapoplasty, which a lot of you have been exposed to. It's really going to be centered on adductoplasty, which was the next thing that we went to. And I'll tell you how we got there. Um, but when we talk about lapoplasty as a group of surgeons who developed this, we are really talking about this entire suite of surgeries from the TMT joint. MTP joint, combining those, and doing midfoot deformity correction as well. So to us, lapoplasty is a philosophy, and it's a philosophy of how to treat things. And we're treating things with, again, in mind that we want to try to restore anatomically as best we can the foot, so it mechanically works the best. And then it, it can, re and we need to have a, a system that allows us to do it reproducibly, and a system that allows us to advance the weight bearing really rapidly because we believe those are the detriments that happen with bunion surgery, essentially. And that's where we tried to go with this. And it's been a fun journey. Being a part of lapoplasty was an incredible ride. And we can talk about that as much as you want. But as we all know, what was going on with bunion surgeries was 150 different ways to do it and very inconsistent results. So how did we get to developing a system that was consistent was really a little bit of just simplification. We just took the elements that weren't working. And that's how we started this whole process. We sat in a room together, four of us, and uh, with uh, John and his support team, 
And we basically were able to come up with what was wrong, what was not working. And by from there, we were able to reverse engineer and figure this out. And what we had found out was that really we had none of us were thinking three dimensionally. Uh, we weren't really seeing the frontal plane rotation. And then we were trying to use older uh, AO uh, principles. I don't want to say older, I should just say the more popular AO principles of hyper compression and uh, you know, hyper rigid fixation that then just wasn't compatible with the weight bearing scenario. So we had to start thinking out of the box. And a lot of things came up as anti dogma to what was out there. So this became a challenge. Uh, but what we went from was this uh, to a really simple process of uh, four steps that got us to the goals that we were trying to achieve, which was essentially getting all three planes corrected in a bunion. We would make precision cuts for uniformity and reproducibility. <laughs> And instead of trying to just cure a joint in its in situ position, we would we were decided we would make the joints cut to the to the position of the foot that needs to get the mechanics right. Then we would control all that with additional instrumentation, and then finally fixate it with what seemingly seemed a little bit outside the box, which was the biplanar plating concept. And that's how we got those four simple steps. Part of this, one of the big advances, was it allowed us to correct everything before we cut. And, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Hunt's been in this long enough to know that, you know, when you do bunion surgeries, a lot of times we would tell the fellows or residents, you don't know what you got till you put in those last few stitches in the capsule, you know. And what lapoplasty allowed us to do is we were able to get correction and see it before we made any commitment to bone cuts or anything else. And so it really became uh, a really fascinating way to look at things is that we could actually get our end result in view before we actually committed to any kind of deformities. And so these, this fluoro and this live radiographs will show you that when that soft tissue re uh, releases are adequate, as well as the um, position of the instruments can be predictable, then you can get some pretty reliable results. And we ended up with this, which was an array of pictures here that now becomes much more pleasing to the bunion surgeon. And that's a funny term to me because when I got into this, I was not a bunion doctor. Not at all. Like, you know, if you had asked me in 2014, do you do bunions? Ah, probably. I mean, I don't do that many. That's the way I thought of myself. I'm an academic orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon. In my brain, I do TTC nails and total ankles and pilon fractures and flat foot reconstructions. I didn't think of myself as doing forefoot, but of course I was doing it. I just, it wasn't important to me at the time. I mean, mainly because I had this thought in my head that bunions really weren't that big of a deal. And, you know, it's just a bunion. And those patients are a little crazy. They're a little bit demanding, you know, so why would I want to do that? And but in all honesty, I was probably doing at least one bunion a week, even as an academic, full-blown, hind foot focused foot and ankle surgeon. Um, but, you know, lapidus was the case I wouldn't do very often because it was so hard and complex. And so I didn't mean it was so hard that I couldn't perform it. It was just so hard to get a consistent result. And it really became a difficulty in recovery and everything else. And I just, I just really hated incorporating them. But as we went along, we became bunion surgeons, those of us that got on this journey, because John had actually given us an opportunity to do a ton of, a ton of research. And, and we began developing philosophies and figuring out a lot of these patterns that were new and exciting. And it was, it was really worthwhile to be a part of that. Um, but then I became a bunion surgeon. And what did that mean? Now I have people knocking on my door to come in for bunion surgery and I have to actually have solutions for all of them. And I didn't at the time when lapoplasty was just getting hold and I understood it, uh, how to correct a bunion three dimensionally at the TMT joint. I was having trouble with people coming in who had low intermetatarsal angles. Well, my lapoplasty kind of needed a big intermetatarsal angle to work. So if I didn't have a big intermetatarsal angle and now I'm, scratching my head what to do for them because I knew I'm, I knew I was doing it right by treating it at the anatomic location I was at, but I wasn't exactly able to get a good result with a low IM. So we actually started developing instruments. We actually called low IM instruments. So we were not, we were seeing low intermetatarsal angles and not even knowing that we were seeing metatarsus adductus. So metatarsus adductus is actually really common and it's very common in bunion deformities and we didn't even recognize it at the time. But this is how adductoplasty got born because we ended up developing a system that led us towards that solution. Before I get there, I'll just review. Lapoplasty has been 
on the podium in publication for now um, almost 10 years. We have had 22, I think, 22 publications now. We've been on the podium almost every year at AACFAS, AOFAS for the last seven or eight years now. Um, we have been at least in poster form too. So we always try to produce our results and be transparent with that. Some of the key things with lapoplasty did. 10 millimeter width reduction. Shortening is limited to two and a half millimeters. Uh, we get our patients back to work or back to their function on their feet in under two weeks. Uh, the reproducibility is in the high 90s percent. Go research all the literature, the fellows, and see what you find. Bunyan surgery doesn't have high success rates in the sum of 90 percent. So much like all your orthopedic stuff does, but Bunyan does not. So we were hitting that high 90 percent reproducibility and uh, union rates. And so this has become something that we are really proud of because I don't know that this has been reproduced. One of the anchoring uh, studies we did to start this was the Align 3D, which was our first multi-center study. We have just reached our four-year mark and we have some of our first patients entering their five-year mark now. Uh, so we've been studying these patients for a very long time. This is what we've seen, the, that the patients return to weight-bearing average 8.3 days. We didn't tell them when they had to return to weight-bearing. So some of these were one day and some of these were two weeks. Uh, the average is 8.3 days, returning to sports at four months. We have 80% say that the pain reduced, and we have 94.8% say the hardware remained, and uh, we've achieved union at the same rate, 98.6%, and the maintained the correction, 98.6% across 173 patients, and uh, carried out now five years. So we feel like that gave us a good foundation that lapoplasty is sound, safe, and effective, and so, from there, we had to now start accommodating these patients who came in with the low metatarsal angle, which turned out to be metatarsus adductus, and that's where adductoplasty formed. It was a very organic thing. It wasn't like we identified metatarsus adductus and said, we need a solution. It was like we identified more bunion patients and we needed a solution. When we did the ductoplasty, um, it was the same flaw, It was the same thought process. When you go through at the beginning here, and I told you the family of surgeries, you see the one up there that says the three, two, one arthrodesis. That's what we're talking about when we say ductoplasty. So there's a certain percentage of patients who present with metatarsus adductus with their bunion, and they cannot be treated the same. And you're going to fail at a high rate when you don't have don't address it. And that's why we came up with a system to help address it. We didn't know how to address it. But way back when, and if you see in the bottom corner down there, it says 2018, which means we thought of this algorithm 2015-16. Treese was started 2014. So it wasn't like we were very far into this journey. And we knew metatarsus adductus patients were different. That's why it circled there. We pulled them out, had no clue how to treat them, and didn't even know how to recognize them really all that well. And we pulled them out and said they're different. Not really sure, but eventually led to an algorithm where we have a different treatment pathway. Those bunions are hypermobile. That's the term we use. It's really just unstable. And then that instability leads to an increasing IM angle and then compensatory Alex Valgus angle. But in metatarsus adductus, it's almost the reverse. They're stiff. They don't have a lot of that rotation of the frontal plane. So they're a different algorithm to treat. Metatarsus adductus is important then because if you don't recognize it, then your hallux valgus, uh, you know, certain percentage of your hallux valgus patients are going to have a lot of problems and not be satisfied. So it is, it is a pathology that is multiplanar. It's been described in the textbooks as a uniplanar deformity. It is not. It's a multiplanar deformity. And I think of it pretty much as like it's just the front half of a club foot, just the hind foot's not involved. Essentially, it's the same thing. And the literature shows the prevalence of this to be somewhere around 30 to 35% of the bunion patients. That's a big number. You know, when we consider that there are millions of bunion patients in the United States, we're talking about a huge percentage of those need to at least be considered is metatarsus adductus a contributing factor to their uh, bunion? And is it a contributing a complication to bunion treatment? So it's really important. How do you recognize clinically relevant metatarsus adductus is not answered yet in our society uh, or in our uh, community of foot and ankle surgeons. We have metatarsus adductus angles and things that we can measure, which are helpful, but nobody knows when it becomes clinically relevant. Um, we have generally sought out to, to address it when it's somewhere between 15 and 20 degrees of the metatarsus adductus angle that's measured. That's the red lines that are drawn up there. 
Um, however, that isn't, it's every, it's every case by case because some patients are a little bit more supple and can be manipulated without addressing it. And some patients are not supple and very, very stiff. And so a smaller metatarsus subductus angle is important and you have to address it. What we have come up with is this yellow line. It's called the plumb line. And the yellow line is essentially the central axis, the biomechanical axis of the foot, at least in theory. No one's proved that. But what, what it aligns to is essentially the lateral border of the first ray. And the lateral border of the first ray when corrected to neutral or to zero degrees. So it's where a lapoplasty can put the first ray. So we have developed this line, not really as a reference of when metatarsus adductus angle is relevant, but when metatarsus adductus angle is relevant to a lapoplasty procedure. So since we do lapoplasty, it becomes important to us. Yes. Can you explain the measurements? Like how are you determining where the line is? So yeah, the, the yellow line or the red line? Oh, okay. So the red line is, uh, is, the, is, the, is essentially you draw a line between the the, the joints of the lateral board of the foot, joints of the medial board of the foot, it's specifically on the medial side, you're between the first TMT and the, first, uh, the tail and navicular joint. And then in the lateral board of the foot, it can be measured either from the fifth metatarsal uh, TMT to the uh, cuboid, or it can measure from the fourth. Either one works. And then you take that and draw a bisection line and perpendicular to that gives you the axis of the of the foot and then measure off of that, the axis of the second metatarsal and that tells you the metatarsus adductus angle. Then the yellow line is a completely independent line. The yellow line called the plumb line is a line that is, the, is really essentially was started off as the lateral distal half of the, the first cuneiform, the lateral border. And you just then draw that line and take it out uh, towards the forefoot and see where it crosses the second or third metatarsals it really correlates with that medial border um, red line as well. So it, it's almost parallel to that. So you take that red line on the medial side, it goes from the, uh, the, actually we tested this out and we found that the most reliable medial line is between the first TMT and the navicular cuneiform joints at that level is reproducible. You take it and just translate it over to the lateral border of the first cuneiform and it gives you that access. So we have a, Paper accepted for that as just recently, and it's going to, and we just published some of this at the AOFAS posters, and we have some of this available that's going to be presented on the podium at ACFAS this coming winter. So hopefully, we have a publication out on this that will give you the direct instructions on how to draw this and use this line. For us, the plumb line tells us whether or not metatarsus adductus is present enough to be clinically relevant when doing a lapoplasty. That's all we can say so far. Now, will that, does it mean it's clinically relevant in all the patients that have metatarsus seductus? We can't prove that yet because we don't know. But we know that if we're going to correct a bunion using the lapoplasty system or the first TMT triplanar anatomic correction, then we need to know whether the second, third metatarsals are in the way. And this plumb line helps us find that. So again, it's, more, it's, a, it's been described as a transverse uh, adduction type of deformity. It's an inversion, really. It's supination. So really, instead of it calling it a, a uniplanar like the old textbooks did, it's really a triplanar kind of deformity. It's just that twisting in of the, all of the forefoot rather than just the movement of the first ray. And here we go more into this plumb line, and this will give you an illustration of what we're talking about. So when we look at the plumb line, and again, proximal to distal projection, of the line of the lateral the distal half of the of the uh, lateral uh, cuneiform margin, and then when you move a lapoplasty, pay attention to the red metatarsal. You'll see that when I correct a lapoplasty, I know where it's going to go based on the fact that we have those cut blocks predictable, uniform, and every case, and we can see where it's going to go. And essentially, that is I got to have enough room, right? That's why I went back to my original thoughts of. I don't have enough IM angle, I can't be successful at correcting bunions. This was where my problem lies. In this case, you would see I have enough room on that left-hand picture. But on the right-hand picture, you can see that the first metatarsal will occupy the same space as the second metatarsal. So if I were to draw the plumb lines on there, you would see the plumb line would have predicted this and told me that on the left-hand picture, I have enough to correct the way I think bunions should be corrected. On the right-hand side, I don't, and I'm going to need to move the second and third metatarsals out of the way to make room for that to happen. So instead of this, 
which was like we saw with lapoplasty all over the place with the metatarsus adductus type of surgeries where there's less predictability, there's less reproducibility, and there's a, a lot of residual deformity left out there when attempting to correct this, we wanted to go to something more consistent. And so this is how, how ductoplasty got developed. We wanted to correct anatomically at the apex. We wanted to correct in all three planes and, that, and we wanted to have options to exist for various types of deformities and revisions. And we the, the design to, to be a consistent technique, just like lapoplasty. Lapoplasty took off because it was consistent. It didn't matter what type of bunion you presented to us. It just mattered. If you could follow the recipe, you could get a, a result that was very satisfactory. Well, that was what we want. Something that you can follow the recipe, you can get a satisfactory result that would um, be pleasing to you and the patient. It took some specialized instruments. This is what we developed. A few things, soft tissue management is very important in bunion surgery. We don't talk about it as much as we should. It's not the sexy part of the surgery, but in all honesty, it's extremely important. We find that all of our surgeries go to a natural correction if the soft tissues aren't binding you up. So the tritone was one of the instruments we needed. That's an instrument that released between the third and fourth metatarsal bases. We developed our own alignment jigs and compressors. Uh, and our cut guides. The cut guides come in some variability because there's variability in widths of the foot, number one. You have a regular width, a narrow width, and a, and a, and a wide width of feet. So it's some variability that matters there. And we, can, we needed some angular options as well because we still were learning and understanding this at the time. But you can see that, um, that the Cut slot is still is going to be uniform, and if you've noticed already, they cut two. We cut two and three at the same time, so that's why width becomes important. But two and three, if they're cut at the same time, but treat them as a block because it helps with uniformity. It's easier to control, and when you start fixating, now you have one unit working as opposed to each individual metatarsal uh, cuneiform fusion treated separately. So then you end up with a lot more stability. This is applicable also for you know, Liz Frank OA and that kind of stuff that goes on. So we have some zero angles as well available just for straight OA. Uh, what we haven't developed and completely understand yet is abduction deformities yet. So abduction deformities might, might be just the reverse of this, but we're not sure yet. We're going to need to still learn more of that. It really is just like lapoplasty, four simple steps. In this case, the planing and releasing. So we're taking those two joints, which are zigzagged or offset. We turn them into one, so that's the planing. When then the releasing of the soft tissues, like I mentioned, then we will cut, then we'll compress, and we'll fixate. And it becomes a very simple four-step process. It does require two incisions. So instead of just the one incision over the first TMT, you're going to have to make another one over the midfoot. Um, we have not found that a single long incision is, is, is able to reach medial to lateral, so we use a two-incision approach. Our incisions are generally about four centimeters apart. That's been proven to be fine for us. We haven't seen any skin slough issues, but also it's very simple. We, you, with the fellows know, if you use the knife, you go straight down and you don't separate those tissue layers, you're not, not going to have nearly as much problems in the, in the foot and ankle. And so this has been safe for us. The first incisions over the TMT, uh, first TMT where lapoplasty is typically made on the medial side of EHL, and then generally it's centered over the third metatarsal for your other. So the first thing that has to happen to make this um, to make this work is that we have to get the alignment uh, of two and three to become one unit. There's a zigzag. We know two comes sets back. So we're going to plane that. That's the yellow dotted line. There's a device in there that just sets in a peg in either side of the, uh, in the center of two and the center of three. That will then create this plane. And now you have a space to put the cut block. And then this, the release is important to be done on the uh, third, fourth interval because that's got to collapse back as you get that base wedge out of there. So you got to get it to collapse back. It's very stout, so you're going to have to release that. You'll see here, Doctor. Oh, excuse me. I thought Doctor. I thought that one would have gone. I believe this is a video. Here's Doctor Carbo. He's going to use the tritone, which cuts on three edges. You go in, you cut the dorsal capsule. He'll turn his hand upward, and he'll get plantar and then pushing it back even further would release even further forward. And so that becomes the interval between three and four, which is where the, where the uh, base of the, of the wedge is going to come out, and that allows the bones to collapse back into the midfoot. 
After that, we're going to place the cut block. We'll size it medial to lateral, which is the important part because we're cutting them as a unit and there's some variability. So you'll take x-rays to ensure that you're not overhanging into one, not overhanging into three. And you can see there's a three-dimensional aspect to this cut block as it goes around the transverse plane. So you got to get square to each one of those facets and look at it up to make sure you have it to cut block properly aligned. Once it's there, you can set it with pins and then you can resect the bones. And now this will allow you this maneuver. If you see the hands moving there, it's an up and out maneuver, which means that it's not just straight transverse. It's actually coming up and out, which allows for you to get that three-dimensional correction. So in, unlike lapoplasty, which requires you to correct before you cut, this is correcting through the cut. And so it's a lot more, it's a lot easier. It's a lot less steps. And so an adductoplasty for me, really after you've mastered the dissection, this is a 30 minute add-on to a lapoplasty procedure. So that's really an interesting, is a lot of people look at this as extremely complicated, which it would have been prior to some standard instrumentation, but it really has gotten a lot easier and more straightforward because of that. And it really it does not add a huge amount of time and it can be done in the same turn of time. Uh, do you ever have to include four and five? Like, like, really Absolutely time? wonderful question. Do you have to include four and five? The answer is no. And we did in the early days when we first were developing this, we were doing four and five as, with osteotomies and other things. We didn't want to fuse four and five as we know that's a much more mobile joint. And what we found is that anything we did was unnecessary and only created problems. And so we stopped doing it, even if they were adducted. And we just made sure that three, four interval was released. And because it's a mobile joint, it's flexible. It moves out of the way on its own. So we don't advocate doing four and five, even if they're severely adducted. We haven't had to do that uh, to date um, because of the mobility of that unit compared to the middle unit. An excellent question. We get that a lot. And we went through those days of trial and error in the beginning. So we get that up and out maneuver and we can assure that we have a closure. We can hold it there with a compressor device, um, just like in lapoplasty, it becomes your third hand. It, it's developed on its own because of the angles. We didn't wanna create any kind of dorsiflexion with it. So you put it way over on the lateral border of the foot. This allows it to close in line with that wedge for the most part. Then you can add your temporary fixation and you're off to the races with applying the hardware. And the hardware is, you'll see here's two plates to apply, but they're one for each metatarsal. So it seems like huh, you're not really getting the same amount of fixation. So lapoplasty, but remember, this is one unit. We have two plates. They are not parallel. They're parallel in the long axis, but they're not parallel in the transverse plane. They're off axis about 30 degrees from one another. So we actually have, when you look, do a three, two, one, you end up with a radius of about six, uh, 60 degrees, 30 degrees, zero degrees, 90 degrees. So you end up with this radius of, of uh, fixation going all the way around the transverse arch. Now, I was at Columbus running the fellowship there for a little while during the pandemic. And one of our journal clubs, we decided to do bone graft and see how much it added to things because there was a debate. Some of us were doing it all the time. Some were not. And we reviewed the literature for the last 10 years and we found independent studies that nothing to do with uh, trees or lapoplasty. And they um, there were four that suggested that bone grafting with autograft at the midfoot was a really significant independent factor to achieving union. So at Columbus, we mandated it. We made it part of our standard for any midfoot surgery. We did autograft from, and generally we take it from the calcaneus. So that becomes normal for me nowadays. And uh, I actually was a big bone graft component anyway. So I did it, I do it with all bony fusions. I take it from the calcaneus. There are devices available for that, which we have, we worked on for about five years to get one to morselize to, you know, a zero profile uh, bone because we have a very precise cut. We don't want anything to open the joint up at all. So once that's corrected, you have your plates in place. And this is what you should expect. And this is my favorite surgery to do now beyond lapoplasty, because these are the patients that cry when you take their bandages off. Their foot has been deformed their whole life. They do not fit in the shoes. This was the shoe. This was the patient who I used to say, you just got to wear wide shoes. And essentially to get this foot in a shoe, it has to be a clown shoe. Narrow in the heel and wide in the forefoot, and it doesn't work, right? So these patients, when you take their bandages off day one, which is when I see patients, they cry because their foot, even though it's starting to swell from surgery, it already looks different and they can already see themselves going into a shoe that they've never been able to do. And so it's my most satisfying 
group of patients to take care of. Um, they really do well. And I look back on the years on how many patients I didn't treat with this. And I'm really shocked how much it was there and how much I just didn't realize it at first. And then when I realized I tried to ignore it and then I finally am now treating it and it's changed everything and how I look at at least that 30% of the bunion patients who are significantly addressed with this. And uh, this is the type of results you can see over and over again. Uh, we've published on this a couple times already. Here's one where we published and showed that the IM angles were able to be reduced and the foot was being able to be narrowed. Uh, we put this was one of the posters to ACFAST last year. Um, and then our MTA study is ongoing where we, at, we can, we're collecting patients just like the Align 3D. So our MTA 3D, we're collecting patients multi-center. We will study them out five years. And we're starting to get our first results to the point where we are going to accept it for the podium at, um, at ACFAST uh, this year coming up. And we're showing that our, again, the same thing, that the reduction is possible, that the function is good. And the important part about this is it's all following the same philosophy for us, just like I showed you the previous slides with the uh, family of lapoplasty. And here is the nice thing is that entire family of lapoplasty surgeries that you, that we call it all follow the same post-operative protocol. Now this one is slightly modified from mine, but what essentially we say is that surgery and weight bearing in under two weeks in a boot boots are typically on for six weeks and non-impact athletics are allowed right away. And weight bearing is just weight bearing in the boot. Now, of course, we tell people they have to control swelling. So the swelling is the big deal. So you guys spend a lot of time icing elevating for two weeks, but they are allowed to weight bear. This stuff holds up. And that's what our original plate screw construct. And I'm getting ready to introduce to you the next technology in the next couple of slides. Yes. Do you make any accommodations for patients with different BMIs? With what? Different BMIs. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I don't accommodate anybody, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, the, we, we, um, we do not have a BMI limit. We, we have contemplating trying to study that over and over. And we, it, it, we just don't have a, a large enough volume of patients. We have 80,000 patients treated and the BMIs range everywhere from 50 down. But, um, it, you know, the average BMI of America is 30 now, right? So um, I'm certain that our average is over 30, but we have not made a restriction on BMI yet? That's a great question. Um, but we also return to sports at four months. So they're returning to regular athletics at, at, um, at four months. They return to non-impact athletics immediately. That's what we mean by immediate recovery. So this, our plan with this was, and why we went to biplanar plating, was that we needed something to allow our patients to not have their life disrupted. I look at this average patient as a 45-year-old female mother of three who's part of the PTA, runs the Boy Scout troop, and has a part-time job. There's no way I can take this mother out of society and things hold together, right? It's going to completely cause chaos, at least in that family unit. And it'll probably bleed over into other family units if that happens. And so my goal, when we, one of my goals and all of our goals, I'm not me alone, was that we had to find a way to make bunion surgery uh, accessible because I really felt like it was unaccessible and, and and a bunion surgery is really unaccessible for multiple reasons that are really strange from other surgeries. One, it's called just a bunion. That's so demoralizing to a patient who's suffering with pain when we call it just a bunion, right? And then we shouldn't be doing that. We should be calling it, you know, an important biomechanical problem. And that's what it is. And, it, you know, because there's cosmetic overlays, it's been diminished because it happens to women more than men, it's been diminished because it's, it happens to this, this woman who's got to hold society together and she won't, uh, she won't have it done. So these surgeries like lapoplasty and these lapidus like surgeries, which had traditionally long recoveries, two to three months in casts and such were just put off, even if they, and here's the big kicker, these patients through a lot of the great patient, direct to patient marketing, they come in and they say, I get it. This is what I want. I understand it now. I was afraid because of the, how long the recovery would have been. So this is what, this is the, why the recovery was so important for us. And that's all of our studies we've been publishing. We've been showing you that, that result, their immediate weight bearing. So let's talk a minute about the hardware. So why did we choose small screws, small plates and biplanar plating? It was because of that patient. We had to make them immediately weight bearing. And it's really quite simple. You only heal by two ways, right? You heal by direct osteosynthesis 
which me, which is an abnormal way to heal, right? So it's, it's a manipulated bone physiology to get direct in cutting cones. We call it primary bone healing, but it's not, it's really not normal. Direct bone healing is not normal. Secondary bone healing or callus formation is what's normal. So a direct bone healing requires zero to one micrometer of motion limit in the construct. And secondary bone healing is, is ideal at seven to 10 micrometers of motion. So at the construct. So if you have zero micro motion allowable, you've got to have hardware and constructs so rigid that they have to hold up and allow zero micro motion in weight bearing. These two conflict because if you get something that rigid, now you've got bone loss from Wolf's flaw, right? Because you're stress shielding. So there is no construct you could create strong enough to create a zero micro motion and weight bear, at least not right now, not in the technology we have. So when we, we looked at it and said, well, let's go with whatever is maximizing the ability to heal secondary bone healing. Can we, can we dial in the amount of flexibility to match seven to 10 micrometers of motion? And to do that, the very first thing you have to do is add um, stability. And stability comes by adding planes of control. So just very simple. Why don't they build buildings out of solid block, I, block rods? They make them out of I-beams because they have more than one direction of stability so they don't flex and bend and break right but as you take a solid rod it will break compared to an ivy so that that's what it is so you just get more than one plane of control this is also simple to us to apply because we think about all those charcot patients who have zero ability to protect themselves and they go out and they walk on these thin wire fixators and they do just fine it's those multiple planes of control that matter. So by adding two planes of control, 90 degrees to one another, it was able then to just dial in the amount of thickness in the plate, the length of the screws to give us a functional unit that somewhat would match what, how much a metatarsal would bend under the same load. And that's how we got here. So it looks simple and it looks like it's, you know, has no sophistication to it, but there's actually a lot of reason why we did it. And before, this wasn't our idea. This came from the AO Institute. And we weren't even the very first people to ever do biplanar plating. Um, and the elbow, it's been done for quite a long time. We all know that. And some other places now in the distal femur and other places where it's being done. Uh, it was done in the foot. Uh, it, it, I think Duke was the first place to publish something on MTP joint fusions with it. So it's an AO principle. It just was day two when a lot of us were skiing in Switzerland or wherever you did your course. Um, it's day two of the course when they teach you about secondary bone healing and how to enhance that. And this is what we go for. Now, the truth be told, I doubt it's purely a secondary bone. Healing. It's probably a combination of both uh, primary and secondary. The point is, though, we allow for some motion, but we don't want too much motion and we don't want it too rigid. And that's how we got to bioplanar plating and <coughs> where we sit today. That's 80,000 cases strong with a non-union rate that's probably somewhere under 2% on the studied patients. We don't have all the data from every 80,000 case, but that's where we are. Now, that's where, we, that's where we've been, but that wasn't where we were going to stop. And one of the principles of laparoplasty and TRIS medical concepts is that nothing is ever good enough today for tomorrow. So we have to keep building. So we've been building on something new every single year, trying to come up with things to improve the process, improve the technique, improve the outcomes. And what we just launched a week ago is something called speed plate. Now, speed plate had its trial and was out for the last six months. We did 200 cases on it, and we had unbelievable results. So good of results that we had to accelerate all the timelines around this because it was showing such superiority, at least in anecdotal information. So speed plate is essentially taking our biplanar plate and screws and creating it as a monitor. A lift, you know, so the screws are already attached. They're already part of the whole piece. So anything that's already attached, you know, is stronger than something you have to attach to it, right? So we know that it's already stronger at the screw plate interface. And it's designed to, to deliver the same amount of stability, um, but maybe gain more through compression. So we know if we interdigitate the bones a little bit, we can gain stability, right? But we don't want to over compress. So we don't want to do over compressing because that will call bone lysis and bone death. And all of these compressors and devices that we have can all create bone death. So you got to be careful with all those instruments. So if we can dial in the hardware to do it the right amount for you, it can be really great. And it's got broad versatility. As you can imagine, this platform doesn't have to stay at the TMT. You can move it all over the short segment fusions around the body. 
And that's always been something I'm fascinated with. I started using claw plates and, you know, Dr. Hunt can remember these back in the day. They were fascinating because you could get short segment compression. It was a little plate screws that had a diamond shape and you'd spread the diamond mechanically and it would pull the tines or the screws closer together. And that was a great technology that I love because short segment fusions, when other things are surrounding, it's very hard to achieve without interfering with other anatomy. And so this is what these staples have all been developed for over the years. The vast majority of the staples that you've seen are used or that you're used to now, unlike the stainless steel we started with is nitinol. Nitinol is a combination of, of titanium and stainless steel, and it's very, very elastic and flexible. And it's, it's a wonderful material, except for it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have a, a huge amount of strength per, or compressibility, excuse me, per link. So it requires a good bit of distance to achieve the amount of compression needed to get bones to heal. This is a problem in a couple of scenarios, as you can imagine. Now, if you have to have a larger distance or you have to have it further spread apart, maybe say you end up with then far side flexibility, right? So the staple is very elastic and then it's got gapping on the far side you don't want. And it also, if it's going to return to its shape, it's got to travel a long distance that can cut through softer bone. And so I think anybody who's ever used a nitinol staple has seen them break, right? They break relatively quick and easy when you use them um, pretty often in foot and ankle. Now, fortunately, a lot of the bones heal anyway, and that's good. But one of the downsides of that is it's basically telling you there's a flaw in the amount of compression you can get with them, despite how it looks. It looks wonderful, but it doesn't usually help. Now, in a nail situation, like in the tibial nail, it's totally different. That's actually loading the whole time. That's a wonderful scenario. But in the short segment fusions, staples are just less than perfect. So if we apply the titanium, which has a much more robust amount of compressibility per length. In other words, it holds its shape under a lower elasticity, then you can able, if you manipulate it, you can actually achieve great amount of compression without um, having to travel too far, put the cutting through the bones as a, at jeopardy and the elasticity be too much for the far side to not fuse or the implant to break. So this is, this is why this implant's got a great reach now. Pro it was developed really as, as, us, as we started to shrink the lapoplasty incision. Most of you know, we went from a standard five to seven centimeter incision to a three and a half, or it's called our mini approach. And we wanted to go smaller, but our plates are at least three and a half centimeters. So we were having trouble. So we wanted to develop something that was smaller, maybe two times. And would that work instead of four? And we started experimenting with this. And this is how we came up with going down this pathway. So everything in lapoplasty and its family is all created because of a need that came about. But then we got the advantages of streamlining the insertion. Well, yeah, you put in eight screws, you get tennis elbow, right? So we know now if we can speed that process up, that would be great. The dynamization we talked about and it's titanium. So you're getting away from those nickel allergy patients, which seem to be coming up more and more. <clears throat> It is still able to be adapted to the biplanar construct, and but gives you a lot of hybrid options. So you can do four times and two times. You can do two four times. You can do two two times, maybe with an augmented screw. We'll show you all kinds of constructs. That leads to a whole new set of adaptabilities uh, for this. It's really set up like everything. When we think through these systems, we think of simple ergonomic steps. Step one position, checking the position and drilling. We have a way to check drilling before committing to a drill hole. We'll show you that in the lab. We're going to have it preloaded, meaning we'll move those tines outward by loading it into this device. So it will go in straight, but then take the load off and it will go to its curve, which will pull the bones together. And it gives you that compression. You release that and it goes forward. So this is loaded by you or your tech right at the time of insertion. And then it's a very simple set of instruments. Comes with its own set of drills and tacks to hold it all in place. It comes with soft tissue sleeves, so you can do this through very small incisions if you wish. It comes in the four pronged uh, variety uh, called the quad, and we have the two pronged 
variety looks more like a traditional staple, but I want you to notice it's curved, that curvature and that thickness and everything was modeled after the plate. That's why we kind of insist to call it a speed plate rather than a staple because it is the plate that's just been adapted into a staple configuration for strength and versatility. And they come in a little bit different lengths so that you can have um, options at depths of the bone. So that's really the depths. And then there are more and more on the, on the, you know, idea line there that we can do for adaption to different joints. This is a fun slide. If those of you that were AOFAS, you might have seen us doing the speed plate challenge. This in the left is going to be the speed plate inserted at normal speed. On the right is a, is a four hole um, plate being inserted at 465% speed so that it was to compare them. And you can see what we have here um, and how much faster. Now the speed is great. That's not the most important thing, but it's not unimportant either. I mean, Tom Lee used to hit us over the head to get under the under our, our tourniquet for everything. And I always thought he was a little excessive, but his point mm -hmm. wasn't that you had to be faster than just to be bragging fast. As we all know, surgeries gain complications the longer they go, especially under tourniquet. And so anything we can do to shorten the surgery, increase the efficiency, it will be uh, appreciated. And so this is just a fun slide and demonstration of why we call it speed um, plate. And uh, you can see we're finishing up with the speed plate on the left and uh, the we're still got a ways to go <laughs> on the right. So uh, speed plate overview here, standard lapoplasty approach. Um, they are now generation two where they're anatomically curved. So they'll fit snugly up against that lateral border. They'll fit snugly up around the anterior tibial tendon border medially. Uh, so that four hole or that quad has the, has the anatomic curve to it, but the two hole is a straight. So you universal way you can apply it. Um, and after temporarily tacking uh, in place, you can then drill all the holes, commit to it. Once you've confirmed on the floor that you're okay, and then it's just simply most of the way down by hand, not with a mallet. The mallet is just at the end to tamp if you need to. We really, I can, uh, of the ones I've put in, I've been able to push it all the way flush to bone and then just a couple taps to get it uh, countersunk a tiny bit. The applications are pretty much universally around the, the, the midfoot stuff that we do normally. You can see the two quads here on this construct to the left. And here's a quad with a two on the medial side uh, with an M1 to C2 screw for additional stability. We have not required that with the middle one uh, construct. Now the right-hand construct, we've done preliminary data, uh, you know, ends of very small ends to test the stability. And when we see two and two together, we feel like you have to have a M1 C2 screw. Um, the quad and two we're testing now again, because we think it may be okay standalone. The quad and quad is obviously standalone. Um, there's never a downside, really, I think, to put those M1C2 or C1C2 screws in. I'm a C1C2 preference person, um, but that it's really just your preference of what you like. Um, but you can imagine when you decrease the number of times on each side of the construct, you decrease the rotational stability. So you have to be aware of that. Um, TN fusion, we've been very excited about that as a nice option. Um, either a standalone or with uh, longitudinal screws. Fractures has been done, navicular cuneiform joint. Uh, you can see there we have uh, lots, of, lots of options going in for uh, the speed plates across the board. And like I said, these are ones that you see that are straight are the first generation. It's the first 200 we put in. And we changed to the anatomic, like the one in the right-hand picture uh, with the four hole. And the adductoplasty, that was my first one I did last week. Um, with a ductoplasty was my very first speed plate case and it, uh, the patient is very excited and happy. So here's a tail and navicular fusion again, <coughs> looking over with a combination of uh, axial screws and 90-90 plating there. Uh, so the limit market release was 41 surgeons, 120 cases, 200 implants, I believe. And the feedback that we generally got, which was so remarkable, was these patients are swelling less, hurting less, and are doing great. And the bones look like they're healed at six weeks. Now, we don't see that with plates. The plates don't look like they're healed at six weeks. Um, and that's because that callus formation is, you know, actually causing the bone to get less dense at the fusion site in early days. But with this, it acts 
somewhere more akin to the primary bone healing. So we're getting some combination of a secondary and primary bone healing, and it looks more robust earlier on. Of course, we have to study this and continue to study it. And that's all I had as far as uh, our slides go. I'll take any questions you have. Uh, you talked about like the benefits of compression with the speed plate. Why not have uh, like eccentric cold be able to compress through the original system? Excellent question. So why don't we have a non-locking eccentric hole to compress more? Um, the main reason is, is stability. Once you got one screw not locked, you no longer have those, you would have to have more screw holes available and you get to a further length out with that. And we know for a fact that if you have a screw not locked, you have motion at that segment. Remember, we're actually using one plate per plane of movement. So it's very critical that all four of those screws are locked. Like not even the option to like put a non-locker and then lock in. Well, there may be some intellectual property we can't get around with that too. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. The uh, I've done several adductoplasty cases and I really like I like I like it for the plumbing correction and uh, not we saw it for a long time and not and um, so I really like it. I think one of the challenges that I found is using the original plastic plates. Some, especially the female patients with smaller feet, those cuneiforms are quite small. And so maybe this new system will make that easier. I just struggle sometimes to get that lack of plastic plate in the right position. So I assume that's. Yeah, my uh, my current go-to will be two holes at the at the lesser TMTs two hole medial and a four hole top on the, on the first. Uh, so I, I, part of that is that concern of length. Um, but also I think it's all you need. Uh, it seems like to me uh, with the extra interdigitation of the surfaces, I believe that's very stable. Uh, uh, the other, uh, one of the things I did see mentioned is how it's Varus. And uh, I sort you know, I don't have much, but I definitely have a lot of plastic case with how it's Varus. I was wondering if that's something you think about if you alter your approach, if it's first web space release uh, or the amount of correction, because you know, compared to the original lapidus procedure, potentially there is shortening the first minute torso here because you're removing more bone. And so it's how it's Varus an issue or the you look at that. Our experience with Varus is it's been very uncommon. Yeah. And it's it's most likely our theory is it's over rotation that typically puts you at the highest jeopardy, except for one other thing and that's medial eminence resection. So the typical lapoplasty approach is not to do any medial approach to the first MTP. So if we needed to take down an eminence or a spur of any kind on the medial side, we typically approach it from dorsal medial or through a small non-capsular invading type incision, and we don't take a saw down to the medial side. That certainly puts you at risk because there's no bony block anymore, but then it's typically a combination of that with an over rotation seems to put you at the highest risk. So it's more of that nuance of learning the over, over rotation position, but there's no doubt we're going to a zero IM as our goal. So we know that that traditionally has put things uh, at risk for helix varus. And we think that what has saved that, the majority of that is just the soft tissue integrity, especially medially on the MTP joint. Yes, sir. So two questions and that was great. Thank you very much for that overview. Um, the first one's philosophical. So, if the last 10 years have seen a lot of change in how we approach bunions. I think you very, very well outlined our approach to the lapidus procedure, which was, I think, largely spearheaded by, by this technology. The other is minimally invasive techniques, which are totally different. They're not anatomic, like the principles are different. Yeah. So, just to our fellows and residents going into to the foot and ankle, because they're going to see both, right? Yeah. They're see well, then lap it eye, and, uh, and they're going to see some MIS. And there are MIS surgeons that say that's the only way to go. Yeah. So can you maybe comment on on this procedure yeah. and why you, you haven't really um, jumped onto the, uh, the MIS? Yeah, we have colleagues that are doing fantastic work with the MIS. And I think that the, the downside or the, the, the big confusing thing when we say MIS versus lapoplasty is that there's no – lapoplasty surgeon who doesn't believe in minimally invasive surgery. 
they don't believe in osteotomies because of the, uh, you can see that the goal we go with is an, more anatomic restoration. They're going with a deformity correction through a different deformity correction. I mean, they're creating a deformity to correct a deformity. I, I don't, I'm not philosophically criticizing them. It's just, they're, as you say, they're in opposite directions of one another. Now, what they're gaining for us is a huge amount of knowledge of how to do surgery indirectly, how to do surgery through poke holes and to get achieve deformity correction. Without it, we can't move forward. We need that extremely important going forward. MIS is by far and away, no doubt, we know that it is beneficial to preserve the soft tissue envelopes, decrease the amount of trauma to the patient, and we can ex expedite recovery. So as you know, recovery is extremely important to me. So I think it's really important. Um, but uh, the reason that the heart of why I do not in endorse osteotomy, and it's not for me, is that I really believe that scientifically we have a lot of evidence that the bunion is generated at the TNT joint. There's always a cora at the TNT with the bunion. They may be large, they may be small. There may be subtle rotation or maybe severe rotation. They're always there. So the TMT joints got pathology. In my opinion, this is not hallux valgus. This is midfoot instability, <coughs> multi-directional instability. And so I believe that joint needs stabilized. I believe when the, the philosophy gets to where some people think the joint needs preserved, but I think it's a pathologic joint. I think it's stabilized. There's anatomic evidence, both the study I produced as well as a couple others that show that the facets of a hallux valgus patient on the TMT joint are different than a facets of a normal patient. A normal patient typically has three facets that interdigitate and become stable. And a pallax valgus patient has more of a ball and socket uni facet. Um, and so that's been repeated in a few studies, including one we published a, a little while ago. Um, and so that's my belief that there's anatomic evidence that the joint is unhealthy and pathologic. And that's why I wanna treat it there. That's the main reason. Now the MIS guys who I'm friends with, who talk to me, you know, sometimes they'll go into a tangent and say, well, we move the base of the first so far medial that it locks up the TMT. And my, why not just address it at the TMT is always my hard part with that. But, you know, if we don't have them exploring this, we don't have more information, right? So it's very important that both go forward. I'm going to come out the winner, but it's okay. I'm just kidding. I love those guys, and we're, we're have, we have a lot of fun debating. I think you're right that this is more predictable because of TMT instability, which is sometimes hard to diagnose. Exactly right. And sometimes develops after the fact. Yeah. So that's where the MIS or any non lapidus procedure is going to fail because that, as soon as that joint starts opening up, you've got to revise it to the lapidus. So my second question is related to cost. So, we, you know, we're we have to be stewards of the healthcare dollar. And we're in an age where there's higher costs and a lot of high deductible demands where patients might notice it a little bit more. So can you comment specifically, if you can, or we can ask actually, because we probably have nothing to do with this, but the cost of the staple versus the plate um, and kind of what's what efforts are going on? Um, I can't answer that directly, um, but I, I mean, I do know the process in general, and you're probably well aware of this, and the fellows can be introduced to this. Every bit of technology that comes forward has taken a long time to get there, right? I mean, and it's a lot of dollars. I mean, it's a lot of dollars. We're talking in the millions to get something like this to market. <clears throat> so to get stable in the market, you got to recoup your cost. Also, there's a, there's, 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 a, there's a science to how things are priced at the proper reimbursement bucket, right? So, you know, you, you, there well, there's a whole group of people at Trees who do this, who follow the science. Um, you know, I get, we get, when you actually break it down dollar to dollar, lapoplasty products sound expensive, but they're actually dollar for dollar, not very expensive in comparison. So um, to osteotomies, screws, whatever, there's, there's costs built into all those cases. I don't know if I'm qualified to say any more than that. I don't know if Aaron or Jason wants to say anything else about it. Was it designed price wise to be the same? So you can go either way. It's not a big jump just because it's speed plate. And we've done that at all facilities statewide. <laughs> Or 
right. I didn't see any on the chat from, from those. So well that that's a wow, that was great. Thank you.